recent years, there has been an interest in native pasture as a result of the improved rainfall. This has led to an abundance of native pasture regeneration and improved ground cover. Landholders are eager to be able to identify these plant species and learn about their nutritional value and palatability. A field day and farm walk was held at Wayne and Nell Chaffee's property near Somerton, where landholders had the opportunity to learn about characteristics to help identify plants and were able to take a close look at many of the species present, as well as take a walk through the paddock and learn how to identify them. Today we're in the paddock at Wayne and Nell's place at Somerton. We're having a, a native pasture ID day. It's being hosted by the Bubba Gullion 100 Landcare Group. And there's been a really big interest in native grasses, particularly with the really good rainfall we had towards the end of last year and the prolific growth. And we've actually been getting probably two or three um, people at the counter or phone calls or texts each week with people wanting to know what the native grasses are because we're really seeing some of the natives come through that we haven't seen for many years, particularly because of the, the cooler summer, the cooler season, the really good rainfall. And it's great to see people um, taking some interest in what's in their paddock. We often you know, look at our livestock, we often try and manage the soils, but it's really important to actually have a look at what our pasture base is because from a livestock perspective, this is what we're really growing. We're growing pastures or grasses, which is then predominantly for the feed for our livestock. So, so knowing what you've got, um, the palatability, whether it's desirable or less desirable, um, the nutritional value is really important. So today we've got about 35 landholders here. We've been uh, hearing from Mitch Witten from BCT, who's been able to talk about the various plant structures, um, some of the identifying features, and Sally Balmain's just had a session on the livestock side of it. So talking a little bit about the nutritional value of these grasses. We're just going to head off up the paddock soon, but it's, uh, it's really good to see um, the interest. People have also brought along some of their own pastures for us to identify, and just the in increasing interest in, in native grasses um, in, the, in this last season. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for the invite, and thanks to Wayne and Nell for having us. As Wayne mentioned, this is somewhat of a reunion for he and I. 12 years ago, Tamworth High School. He informed me that two years after I left, he also left. So assuming there was no reason to go on after I left that school. <laughs> so here we are, yeah, correlation, anyway. So yeah, Mitch Whitten, um, I work for the Biodiversity Conservation Trust based in Canada. Um, I've spent about seven years doing this sort of general thing, work with George and Sal at, um, at LLS for, for three and a bit years before moving over here. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm from Gowrie, if anyone knows where that is, part of the old Gunnaganoo station originally, so off the land out there. Um, the, the business I work for, BCT, we're a state government organisation similar to local land services. Uh, in a nutshell, what we do is work with landholders who want to establish uh, private land conservation agreements uh, on their property uh, and there's certain funding and other opportunities that can go with that. So if anyone's interested in, in that sort of thing, I've got a few business cards here um, and yeah, we can have a chat uh, at lunch. Um, so what I'm going to go through today uh, is how to identify grasses so I think we can probably all agree they're one of the hardest things to identify. Eucalypts are pretty hard, acacias are even worse and these guys are top of the list. The main reason being is they're basically impossible to identify uh, for big portions of the year so to get a proper ID we really need the reproductive organs of the grass um, it's not always the case. There are some species which will have a key um, defining feature, something about the leaf or the roots that are really unique to it, um, but it's quite rare. So I'd be hesitant to um, ID anything that isn't actually in flower, in full flight sort of thing. So an example of something that 
You could ID without. Um, the, the flower head is something like Ornless Barnyard Grass, if anyone knows what that is. So it's, it's a grass of sheep yards and that sort of thing and the leaf has a really prominent purple stripe on it. Can't miss it. Little low growing thing. So there are a few exceptions to, the, to this rule such as that, but generally we want that you know, big, uh, big open flower head. Um, so we're going to go through some of the, the more common species which we've got with us here today, which is great. Um, I'm going to outline the structure of grasses, what they all share in common and how they're different. And that can really help us nut out exactly what we're looking at. So before we get started, we really need some good resources. We can't just look at something and off the top of our head know what it is, otherwise we wouldn't have this day today. So um, this one here is the absolute Bible. I would probably not recommend it to your average Joe because it is, uh, what would you say, legalese, plantees, it's, it's got everything in it. So it's great if you're really keen and want to nut everything down to species. So um, Wal Whaley um, from UNE is one of the big authors. I don't know if anyone knows Wal. He's like the uh, Don Bradman of grasses, is what I like to call him. He's an absolute legend. Um, this little book here, Common Plants of Grazing Pastures in a Low and MI Floodplain, this is a cracking little book. It's got a handful of the grasses and um, some of the herbs and forbs as well. Um, I think, George, we, there may be some of these in the LLS office. They're starting to go extinct, but that's a good one. The best of all of them is this chap here. So this is uh, grasses of the New South Wales slopes and adjacent plains. This is probably the best book for identifying grasses for the purposes that most of us need today. So it doesn't have every grass in it, but there are 450 grasses just on the slopes of New South Wales. So this will nut it down to family at least. So this is a really good book. Um, and I'll, I'll be using it a bit today to, to help myself. Um, so before we even start looking at a grass, we have to have a look at where we are in the landscape. So just like the plants in your garden or the things in a rainforest, grasses like different landscapes, different environments, some like heavy alluvial, some like sand, some like plains, some like rocky slopes, some like, you know, salty marshes. So have a look around, where are you? Because that can be a key defining feature um, of that particular grass. Basic example, plains grass, which I think we've got here today. So this is a lover of heavy alluvial soils. You're not gonna find it up on the top of some rocky hill somewhere. Um, so it's a good way to be able to rule things out just by looking at the landscape and having a bit of a read about what particular species like. Um, we can have a look at things like disturbance levels as well. Um, certain species are extremely grazing sensitive and some are really tolerant to grazing. So Bambatsi panic, um, it is really tolerant to grazing. It's bred to be that way. Um, we know it can handle it. Things like this lobed blue grass is quite rare in the landscape. Its cousin, red grass, is quite common. It can handle grazing, but this is one of those um, sort of few natives that is actually quite leafy and it will get grazed out very quickly. So if you're in a heavily grazed paddock, it's probably not going to be this. So that's just something you can, you can rule off your list. Um, so now we can get down to actually looking at the specimens we've got. First thing, is it an annual grass or is it a perennial grass? Now most people are probably going to know what all that means. Forgive me if I'm repeating things you already know, but I will run through it. Uh, so annual grasses are those species which complete their full life cycle within one season. So all they want to do is stick a root out of that seed, get as few leaves as possible, shoot up, wave their genitals in the air and reproduce and then die. And you know, that's the dream. So one season, they'll have that full life cycle, prolific cedars and on and on they go. Um, whereas perennials, they've got a bit more strategy of, let's dig down here, I like it here. We'll put down a big root system. I'll get nice and big. I might not flower for a year or so, but I'm here for a long time. So those different life strategies, I suppose. So 
the best way to tell um, is to actually have a good look at the root system. So, as I said, annuals, quick growing, um, and as a result, their root systems are generally not that extensive. So, if it's something you can lean down and pull out of the ground with one hand, say, liver seed grass or something like that, it's probably an annual. You'll know just from observations in your paddock as to what species are coming and going and which ones are sticking around. Um, whereas perennials, um, they generally have a really extensive and deep root system and you're probably going to need a mattock to, to dig them out. So I think uh, like cooler tie grass, for example, you're not just going to lean down and pull that out of the ground. Um, so that's just a good way to tell the difference. Um, and also have a look at uh, their growth form. So when we're looking through these books and it talks about the different grasses, it'll talk about is it a tall tussock um, like like our kangaroo grass or is it um, something that runs along the ground um, and shoots out of rhizomes like cooch, which is also here somewhere. Um, also have a look at other really, people sometimes miss the obvious things like the colour of the leaf. Some have a really distinctive bluey colour uh, to the leaf, like uh, your Queensland bluegrass, um, your native millet, bambatsi, um, really, really bluey green. And then you'll have things like uh, gat and panic, which is that really vibrant green colour. Um, so it sounds obvious, but it's something a lot of people miss is to just step back and have a look at, at the basic things. Um, and one thing to be cautious about is that everything I've just told you can differ for the one species depending on the environment that it's in. So if it's a particularly dry season, for example, it may not form a big tall tussock. It might stay stunted for, for years. Um, recently, I spent about half an hour trying to identify a grass. I thought I really had it, wasn't sure, and then later learnt that that paddock had been sprayed with a hormonal herbicide and so the complete structure was all out of whack. So knowing a bit about the context and the environment is, is really useful as well. So what I'm going to run through now is the exciting part. We're actually going to get in and have a good close look at some of these grasses. While they may all look very different, um, they're not as complicated as they seem. They all have the same uh, unit of flower, which is called a, a spikelet. And some of the features may vary, but the structure will always be the same for all grasses. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run through all the different parts. Um, I should say before, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and uh, I can, we can have a chat or we can just talk afterwards. So, uh, quick one, you talk about annuals and perennials. Yes. I believe there are some that uh, like two years, like a biannual. Biannual, that's right, yeah. So yeah, they're those, yeah, in-between ones. Yeah, if it's a particularly good season, they might live for, you know, three or four years sometimes, but in a normal year, they may only live once. So yeah. Yep, that's right. Um, just like in your garden, for example, normally a tomato might only grow for the summer, but if you've got it growing up against a nice hot shed, a particular area, you know, it'll keep producing. So it's that same sort of concept. Um, okay, so the flower head. First, we start off with a little stem at the bottom. This can be so tiny that it's non-existent. Sometimes it can be quite pronounced. Next thing we have is a structure called the glooms, which is a fun word. And the glooms are basically an empty bract that sits at the bottom of that flower spikelet. So think of, uh, say, a, a rosebud. Before it opens, it has that green outer layer. This is a bit like that. It sort of encloses the, the flower head of that grass. And what you'll have is what they call a lower gloom and an upper gloom. So one will sort of start before the other on this little stem. Um, and I'll get into the variations of these um, a bit later. So the next thing we have, and excuse my terrible drawing, is a floret. So this little guy um, is actually made up of a few components, which I'll get into. And this actually houses um, the flower. So it itself, I'll pretend this is a, a magnified version of the floret, it itself is made up of a very similar structure to the glooms and it's called a lemma and a palea. So we've got one name for these ones down here and two up here just to make it hard for everyone. So lemma and the palea and actually inside here 
since the ovary, which is what this, the grain or the seed will form. We have the stigma that come off here. These are the, the female parts that collect the pollen. And then we have the male parts, the anthers, that'll come off like that. So all those reproductive organs are housed here. I might label them actually. Right, so we've got our gloom and our floret. Inside our floret, we've got all the reproductive organs. So then inside this spikelet, we can have more of these florets, which will have the same structure, same reproductive organs inside, something like this. So this is probably starting to look familiar to people. This is really obvious on something like uh, prairie grass. It's probably the best one. It, it sort of looks, it's nice and big, you can see all these things. Now for some grasses, they have a predetermined number that can grow here. It might only be one or two. Some can be all the way up to 25 seeds all up in here. And for some species, like your love grasses, the number will just be determined on the season. So your, your paddock love grasses, they can, if it's a poor season, they might only have the resources to grow seven of these individual florets in here, where it's if a good season, they might get so many that it ends up, you know, drooping over. They might get 25 odd in there. So it's really um, season dependent. Any grain growers will sort of sympathize with that. And so th this is the basic structure for all these grasses. And what we can have is uh, different structures um, that are really key defining features for a lot of these. So some will have some hairs off the base here. Some will have some fine hairs on the glooms. Um, your paspalums, they've got these nice stripes here on the florets. Some species have what's called a keel that runs along the back, like the bottom of a yacht, you know? So um, what else? Some have a little gland down the bottom here. So there is huge variation just within that part of the grass alone. And, and really, you're gonna need a hand lens to be seeing this stuff. Um, but that just, you know, the structure is always the same just with those variations inside. Um, okay, so moving on, let's see if this actually rubs. Oh, geez, it does rub out. That never happens. So now we've sussed out that base unit and I'll, I'll try and show you an ex some example of some of these. So this is a, one of the native love grasses. We'll pass a few around. So that dark part on this stem, that is the individual uh, floret, uh, sorry, individual spikelet. So if you look really close, you can see the glooms at the bottom, just pass them around and we can have a look later. So you see those two glooms at the bottom and the, the rest of it forming above. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the actual structure of the flower head itself. And it's normally the most obvious thing for then nutting out what species it is. Uh, this little book is an absolute cracker because, I don't know if you can see, it's color coded on the pages there. And it's, it breaks down um, all the species in here depending on the flower head type. So if you can get one and go, oh yes, um, I know that's a panicle, then you just go to the panicle part and you can flick through and you've ruled out a whole stack of grasses. So there's uh, five, um, five main types and I'll quickly run through all of them and show you an example of what they all look like. So the most basic one is called a spike. And my notes are getting away. So a spike is a single, it's called a raceme, we can call it a branch, whatever you want. But all those florets we talked about, they will grow directly off that spike or off that branch there. So we have an example here. This is buffalo grass. It's good or bad, depending on who you ask. But as you can see on it, might be a bit hard to see, come and have a look a bit later. 
all those individual florets are growing straight up against that stem. And you can see for this particular species, they're really clustered in against that stem. There'll be ones like ryegrass where they're actually a lot more spread out, something. So this next one is called a primary axis uh, of racemes, which is not dissimilar to our spike, except for one feature, which is it will have branches that come off it like this. And then that is where our little florets will live off there. So the example we've got here for that, and that might look familiar to people as uh, Paspalum, it's probably the most obvious one, which is here. So here you can see we've got this one spike and then off it we've got these branches. And those individual florets, those flower heads we talked about before are growing directly off those branches. So that's called a primary axis of racemes. The next one is, uh, is one step up. So we've got our main stem, we've got some branches, and we've also got some extra branches coming off as well. And it's off those second and third and fourth branches that our florets will actually grow. So that's things, this is probably the most common one we've got. Um, we've got plains grass here. Um, we've got all of our love grasses all grow like that. One thing to be careful of is, while well, this is sort of the most um, common one you'll probably see, sometimes these branches are pressed flat up against that primary, uh, that primary stem that runs up there. Um, so here's an example. So, oh, well, some of the Aristides are a bit like that. We don't have one that's a really good example, but this is what's called a closed panicle. So when you read about it, it will say, yes, it's a panicle, and they can range from open to closed. And what you'll need to do is, when you get your flower head, you really need to you know, pull it apart and have a good look and see how many layers of branching there are. A good way is to get it and actually bend it over. And you see I've done that, this little branch here has stuck up. So when I look at that, I can actually see those extra layers of branching in there. So while that might look like one spike with the, the florets coming off it, it is actually a multi-branched um, species in there. Um, so the next one, uh, is digitate. Um, Premier Digit's a good one. Windmill grass, so digitate, we've got our, our same uh, spikelet, oh sorry, our same um, stem that will come up. And then we've got branches, but they're all coming off a single point, generally on the top like that. Um, I'll use this example. So yeah, our windmill grass here, these are getting on a bit. But you can see there's our stem and then we've got our branches that are coming straight off from that center point. Um, another interesting example is these bothrocloas, these, these blue grasses, um, Queensland bluegrass, the dicanthiums, they're the same. Again, a bit like our, our panicle, they can come in an open form like that or they can spend most of their life pretty much closed up like that. So you've really got to get in and start pulling them apart to see what's what's going on. So for these guys then the little florets will grow you know straight off those those secondary branches. You can also get um, grasses that are subdigitate and uh, the, the uh, premier digits a good example of that is where most of the uh, stems will come off that single point but sometimes they will have um, a secondary point as well a bit like the spokes on a bicycle. So it can range from this digitate with you know just one on top or subdigitate where we've got this multi-branching happening underneath as well. The, the rarest of all the grasses, there's only a handful, uh, rare is in the type, they're quite abundant as Kulatai is, um, it's called a spathiate. And so a spathiate is its own sort of special one where we've got our, um, our stem here, we've got some branches coming off it, um, then we've got our floret, and then on the floret, there is a little leaf-like structure called a spathe. That's where they get spathiate from. Cooler tie grass, it has those 
two florets that everyone will be familiar with. I remember it because it's like it's given you the, that's how I remember it. It's, yeah. And uh, it, if you have a really close look at it, in that structure, we'll actually have a little leaf there called a, called a spathe. Um, kangaroo grass, it falls into that category as well. So if we have a close look, there's actually a tiny little leaf, a leaf that exists in that, um, in that structure there. So there's not many. Um, so your Yosemites have it, uh, cooler type grass, the introduced one. Um, your Simbapogans, which is your barbed wire grass, um, it falls into that category as well. So it's a good example of where you really need to, um, to get in, open, open those seed heads up with your fingers and have a look. And that is pretty much all I was going to talk about today. Um, I hope you've learnt something. Those resources that the George has handed out um, are very good. Again, I couldn't more highly recommend um, getting this book. It is available online at the Tokal College website. So this was written by Harry Rose. Um, he's another grass guru. Um, and as I said before, the, the beauty of this book is it it organizes itself um, based on those flower head types. So before you even start having a close look at the florets, you can just go, oh, okay, that's a, there's two layers of branching there. That must be a pentacle. And you just go straight to that section and you can just flick through till you find it. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. So I'm Sal Balmain. I'm the livestock officer with the ag team. I work with George. Um, home is halfway between Bingra and Baraba. Um, and I work out of the Warrialda office for the most part of the time and I'm my big caveat is my plant ID skills are so subpar it's not funny but I, there's lots of tricks you can get away with when we talk about palatability um, from these and it's mainly just feeling them so I like I was saying to Mitch earlier like the, um, I really struggled, I hadn't heard of, and I really struggled to find any literature on the lobed bluegrass. Um, and I didn't know why, Mitch was saying like, it's generally grazed out, it's quite rare to find. And I can see why, like it's beautiful, soft. Um, it's got really nice, like quite wide, soft leaves. So it's, it's gonna be palatable. Um, and even though it's in um, sort of senescence, it's, it's gone reproductive, it's still not savage. Like if I compare it to something like he was saying, it's quite closely related to the red grass. Like if I compare it to my red grass, it's a lot spikier. I can tell straight away it's heaps more fibrous. So the more fiber in something, the less desirable it is to consume, the, the less palatable it's gonna be and the harder it is to digest and the less you're gonna get out of it when you eat it. So I suppose that's the other thing to sort of caveat. When we talk about palatability, it's not necessary. Generally, it's correlated to performance. So the things that taste better, animals will perform better on, but not always, I suppose. Um, the other thing is generally, most things are really palatable when they're young. Um, even the roly-poly, like it hasn't actually got that spiky and hard yet. So it will be palatable, but then as soon as it starts to get sharp, things are going to stop eating it. Um, as far as performance goes, um, you know, this guy being, I suppose, a little bit more introduced, I suppose we'd call him. He's sort of up there, the digit, um, big, beautiful, broad leaves. Um, so going to get a lot more performance out of that than you will something that is still palatable. So like our plains grass, it's starting to be past the point. Like if I feel it now, like it is starting to get quite spiky, but also my leaf is so thin and minimal. I'm never going to see the level of performance out of it because it just doesn't contain um, contains a lot of fiber, which isn't sugar and energy and things that are going to make us do, if that makes sense. Um, the goosefoot, um, I had to Google it, sorry, but yeah, 
highly palatable and also quite nutritious. The protein when they tested it came back really high, which is like a little bit surprising looking at him because he's not particularly leafy, but the seed head's still quite soft, I suppose, um, and not awned. That's the other thing. Sheep in particular, they can't deal with awns. It spikes their eyes, gets in their wool, gets berries into their skin and things like that. So they won't eat it. Um, our friend Cooler Tie Grass, palatable young, we can force stock to eat it later, particularly cattle, but they will need a protein supplement to get through it, I suppose. Um, too much fiber in the system, the bugs don't have enough protein to build up numbers themselves. Um, so everything slows down and then the animals are restricted by capacity, which means they just can't eat enough in a day unless we give them some help. Like spraying molasses on cooler tie grass or any dry standing feed. So molasses is sugar and I mean, who doesn't love sugar? It will increase its palatability, but the downside to molasses is there's no protein in it, it's just sugar. So whilst it makes it tastier, the molasses doesn't really do a lot to help them digest the cooler tie grass. We still need a protein supplement to feed the bugs. So yeah, it'll, to a certain extent, it'll increase their intake of it, but then they still can't become constrained by that physical fill capacity and the fact that it's quite hard to digest. So they, if the bug numbers aren't functioning well enough, they rely on cud chewing. So they spend so much time spitting it up, trying to reduce particle size so that it can pass through, um, that they just can't eat to their requirements if that makes sense. So like if we think about us, whilst fiber speeds up passage in our digestive system, does the opposite to ruminants. So it slows them, slows them down. Sorry, so can I just add to that? Mm. If you add some urea, like you feed the bugs. Yes. Then you can like change the system so that if you feed the bugs. Absolutely. And the bugs die and they'll turn into Yes. And then you've got your cow um, munching away. Yep, so the urea makes more bugs, which then help chow through the poorly digested feed. Um, and then as those bugs die and pass through the rest of the digestive system, they're the protein that feeds the animal. What uh, bugs do you So the microbiota in, um, so it's a combination of bacteria, protozoa, Any more questions? Um, yes. Any grasses that actually toxic as well? Yes. Good point. Le nice lead. <laughs> yes, there are. Um, stink grass is particularly toxic to horses. Generally, because of the stink, there's a, a bit of an aversion to it. Um, ruminants handle it a little bit better than the equines, um, but it's toxic. Even things like your um, paspalum at certain times can be toxic. It's prone to getting a, I can't see the paspalum sample, but it's prone, it can be prone to getting a bit of an ergot in the seed head, which can lead to, you might have like paspalum staggers, they call it. Ryegrass can do the same thing, ryegrass staggers. Um, some of our other ones, even bambatsi panic, a monoculture of it. So we lost a couple of years ago, we lost a lot of sheep out near Wee Wall um, that were predominantly grazing Bambatsi. It sort of, they were fine on it, then there was a rain event, and then I think out of about 140 heads, something like 90 died. Um, so it can have some issues. Um, some of our more Demia ones um, and anything actually to be honest. Nitrate poisoning can be a real issue at the start. Even good old oats can, can lead to nitrate poisoning. We've seen that. And basically what happens is the plant uptakes a heap of nitrogen to, to grow in the form of nitrate. And if it's consumed by the animals before the plant gets a chance to use it up, um, it's, it's toxic, 
stops the um, body from being able to carry blood. So it's fatal. Uh, sorry, stops the blood from being able to carry oxygen. So it's um, fatal. Um, this guy, he's pretty toxic. Um, he contains an alkaloid. And look, generally, stock don't eat the purple top that much. That's why you see it left. Um, most of these things, unless we force them to eat it, they will have a natural aversion. Things like alkaloids and stuff like that, they generally do have a taste to them. Um, goats, goats grazing purple top when it's still young. Um, goats can sometimes be a little bit more tolerant to alkaloids and tannins and things like that um, than sheep and cattle. The, the, like not extensively more tolerant, but sometimes be a little bit more tolerant. Um, and I think with a lot of those things, it's a matter of diet selection, like availability. Um, if there's lots else that's more favorable, they'll probably take that first. Um, and sometimes it can be a learned thing. So sometimes, so things like rock fern, there's a real learnt, a real learnt behaviour in not eating it. Um, and we actually really lost that um, during the drought for a couple of years where we didn't see it. And then when the rock fern came back, the few older stock that remained knew not to eat it. But then younger stock that grazing was actually quite novel to, they ate it and it had ramifications. So look, no, it's because it's not the dominant. Big headed, big head in horses in all C4s actually presents a real issue. So even horses running on cooch, kaikuyu, things like that have a um, risk of getting big head. So um, oxalates, a lot of the, those plants produce oxalates. Ruminants are pretty good at dealing with oxalates. They're pretty good at detoxifying them. There are some times when they do present a problem. But with equines, what we see is the oxalates bind up the calcium. And so the animals actually, horses will actually start to become really calcium deficient. And in an attempt to sort of restore that, they're drawing calcium out of their bones and it deforms the shape of their head. Um, so supplementation, calcium supplementations really, because you generally, in a lot of cases, don't have anywhere else to put the horses. Um, so calcium supplementation on those is really, really important. Calcium supplementation on our natives. Um, traditionally, we would calcium supplement ruminants to avoid milk fever and things like that. Tends not to be a, as great a risk on our tropicals um, and our native pastures as it does on our temperate and, and winter cereals are probably the worst for it. The plants themselves naturally lack calcium and they're also generally when we graze them really high in potassium and really high in protein so really high in nitrogen and those two things are antagonistic the technical word but basically means they hate on calcium and magnesium are the two um, and so we run into deficiencies there um, particularly if we've got anything that's calving or lambing just because their calcium needs increase with milk drawdown um, and so calcium supplementation on those crops is really important. Look, some people will blanket um, calcium. Sodium's the other one that tends to run hand in hand with calcium um, supplementation. And again, that's because of the high levels of protein and high levels of potassium interfering. And sodium, there's a thing called the potassium sodium pump, which um, makes the body work, I suppose, in short. Um, and so we need a certain amount of sodium in the system to, to run. The other cool thing is most things eat salt and most things won't eat straight line by itself. So it's cool that they get to go hand in hand. Traditionally, urea was always the cheapest. Yeah. Now, obviously, urea has taken a bit of a major escalation in price. But what makes urea the cheapest is when we... Um, I suppose, convert nitrogen to protein, um, urea comes in at 280% protein. So it's huge bang for your buck. I'm not, I don't advocate for the use of urea in sheep. Sheep recycle nitrogen a fair bit better than cattle do. The downside to that is urea kills them a fair bit better 
then it kills cattle. So I don't love urea. I, as a general rule, I won't advocate for urea supplementation in sheep. If you've got some old weathers or something like that, maybe 2% urea in a lick. Um, but other than that, it's mainly about what you can get bang for your buck wise is where I sit on protein supplementation. So um, something like cottonseed meal, 40, 42% protein, um, generally does cost double PKE or something like that, palm kernel meal, but then palm kernel meal is only 20% protein. So the double's kind of worth it. Um, so yeah, I'd advocate for affordability for protein supplementation. And yeah, urea and cattle, traditionally, like obviously it's gone from what, 400 bucks to a thousand, um, but it's still probably quite, you don't, a little bit goes such a long way. Um, you just have to be careful um, if you've got it out. I like loose lick rather than blocks. Um, you get a bit more bang for your buck. Um, but if you're feeding it out, it just can't be in, in water. So if you're feeding it out in troughs, your troughs have to be able to drain because um, those puddles of water will be lethal. Why do you like the better than the blocks? Better bang for your buck. Uh, in a block, we have to put in things to make it a block. That, so there's a large component of that that's not nutritionally contributing to the diet. Um, and the other thing with the block is they have, what, 50 bucks? 40, 50 bucks? You don't get a lot. If we're chasing calcium supplementation, say we want to give them however many grams of calcium per head per day, generally we can't get that out of a block or they have to consume a lot of a block to get that because too much calcium in a block stops it from setting. Whereas in a loose lick, we can bang it up as high as they'll eat it. Um, and if we put a loose lick out and they don't eat it, we can tweak it. Yeah, I'm. there are definitely some schools of thought out there that are all about free choice supplementation. I'm not. Um, my personal experience is I've seen them eat things until they die. And I've also seen them, so um, phosphorus deficiency, most of my work prior to joining these guys was in Queensland. And I've seen cattle so phosphorus deficient, a bit of a duck step in the yard and they break their legs. And we've struggled to get them to eat phosphorus supplement. So I'm kind of a no on that, with the exception of salt, they'll self-regulate salt. Um, Sulfur, to a certain extent, I've seen the meat, particularly over on the coast. Um, and in some cases, we do see cattle eat bones or straight kind of phosphor phosphorus, but then other cattle turn their nose up at it. So, you know, like I've seen cows dying of milk fever that won't eat the calcium lick. So I'm, I'm not, I kind of think we know what they need and it's up to us to manipulate their diet to do it. The, what I base my stuff on is there was a lady who did some studies on the equivalent IQ of horses. And she said that they um, have the equivalent of about a sort of a toddler. Um, and so if we say cattle, are, you know, maybe we'd give them a little bit less down the chain, depends where you sit on your equine love. But if we, like if I say to my two year old, you choose between broccoli or a biscuit, she's picking the biscuit. Um, Cause it's palatability. Um, so yeah, I'm not a free choice advocate. Saying that though, so in the drought, I think just hunger got the better of a lot of stock. And so they ate whatever we put out. Um, and the last couple of years haven't been horrendous for metabolic issues either. So I'm pretty hawky about cereal crops this year because I think it's gonna be a really cold, wet winter, which I think is going to see a lot more grass technique milk fever and stuff like that come through. Mm -hmm.